before we start off the session, I'll quickly lay the context uh, for this session. Uh, I think it goes without saying that uh, big tech and platform companies are pervasive. It impacts the way we think, the way we speak, and increasingly the way we speak also, and the way we vote. Uh, what we have seen is that for the longest time, big tech and platform companies didn't really face any scrutiny or accountability. But in the last few years, it has really changed. Uh, what we now know is that systems that have been built by platforms, uh, they're directly linked with growing information, misinformation, polarization, and of course, online hate in our society. In fact, just a week back, uh, Wall Street Journal did a damning report uh, on how Facebook works and how it has long known. Uh, the kind of dangers uh, it poses to the society and how often it has uh, not really put or implemented the fixes because in order to sort of optimize uh, for the growth. Uh, the idea of this session, hence, is to sort of discuss tech reporting and the challenges it faces. Uh, I'm a big market reader myself, so I have a lot of questions uh, uh, for Julia, who is with us uh, today, uh, especially with the kind of tools uh, Markup uses uh, for their reporting. Uh, but in, 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 in the interest of time, I'll try to keep my questions specific to tech reporting. And if then time per permits, maybe I can squeeze in a couple of more questions. So uh, Julia, welcome. And thank you so much for taking out the time. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Great. Uh, uh, Julia, let me start off with uh, one thing that I think really makes markup stand out, which is the use of tech to report on uh, technology or big tech, so to say, right? And if I'm not wrong, half of your newsroom comprises of programmers and data scientists. Uh, so, and, and that's like a approach which is fairly, say, new or alien to Indian newsrooms, where people who work on tech or our developers, they're not really just working on the tech stack of the website to sort of distribute the content, but they're also effectively journalists and storytellers. So could you just uh, explain it to us why that approach is central to the kind of work uh, uh, Markup does? Uh, and, uh, and what is like a daily day like for a programmer at Markup? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's this is an experiment in a new kind of newsroom. There are, aren't that many newsrooms that I know of that have invested so heavily in programmers working as journalists um, in the newsroom and having such a one-to-one -one ratio of writers to programmers. The reason I did this is because um, when you think about what tools journalists have to collect data, right, we interview you other people so we have like you know human data collection, we can obtain documents. Um, in the U.S. we have decent public records laws so we can request um, public information and you know we can occasionally sue <laughs> for information and we can get leaks from employees but one piece that i felt like was missing from all of that was the fact that automation can help us collect data at scale right that's another avenue for journalism so basically our programmers are out there scooping up lots of data that is publicly available on the internet um, or analyzing public records that we've gotten in some other way but then ingesting them into a database and analyzing them that allows us to basically move from the world that journalism is often occupied which is the three anecdotes you know and you have a story right like you find three people who are doing whatever and you're like this is a trend right can move to a world where we have more data. And so basically we can say, this isn't just anecdotal, this is actually you know, a pervasive trend and we have more evidence that it's really happening in the world. And so that's what I've made my bet on is that you know, just because, just like technology companies are using automation to their benefit, journalism should also use automation to its benefit. Got it. Okay, uh, so just quickly on that, I don't know how, uh, just uh, because while we were speaking quickly came off my mind, I don't know how salaries uh, work in US, but like in India, like the kind of salaries tech people draw, it's just like, uh, it's not possible for newsroom to hire them in reporting role. I think that's one of the challenges with retaining the right tech talent for news organizations also. But moving on, coming back uh, uh, to the approach, I also see that you release whatever data set, code, uh, or whatever database you use 
for reporting that's like released w- along with the story uh so how how essential is is that process because i think and and your website also reads that you want to build trust rebuild trust in journalism one data set at a point so from a ter- trust perspective how important do you think is it to release whatever data set or code you have used in a reporting to sort of build in building trust with the reader who whoever is reading the story yeah i mean you're correct in identifying trust as the issue here right i mean one reason to move from the world of three anecdotes to bigger data is to build trust with readers because honestly um people at least in the us have really become pretty cynical about media and what they choose to cover what they consider news and so we want to show show basically as much as we can be really transparent we call it show our work philosophy so we publish the data we publish the code we use to analyze the data we write little notebooks and descriptions of the data itself um we try to be really open kimono about what we're doing because i think people are desperate for a feeling of something that they can trust out there there's a lot of news these days that is very much gamed you know um in the us i think there's like at least uh i think that ratio is eight pr people to one journalist or something right so there's so much orchestrated leaks or trial balloons that are floated through the press and all sorts of gamesmanship that happens through the press and the public has become aware of that and more cynical about it and we want to be really clear that we're on the side of the public we're here doing the work to to tell the public what's actually going on. We don't want to participate in all of those games. We just want to tell you the truth about what's happening in the world and how um how you're being affected by it. Do you think it's even more important because you're reporting on tech and the biggest of the tech companies have massive uh uh PR and media machinery so like they come back at you saying that your data set or whatever your research or only is not credible and hence your report is not credible do you think that by in itself makes it a lot more important to release the data i think so when you're looking at companies like facebook um that basically regulate speech around the world right like there's an argument you can make that Mark Zuckerberg is more important than any world leader because he can decide literally he personally can decide what it, you're allowed to post on Facebook or not in any country and you know he gets lobbied by the government and whatever but he does decide and he really controls a lot of public discourse and so for us you know journalists are are in a position where it's really difficult to to actually show what is facebook doing or not doing in a particular country because they hear a report here or an anecdote there and so we have tried to take a systematic approach to that by building this sort of unique thing which is a panel a representative panel of users across the US who have allowed us to tap into their facebook feed analyze that data so that we can say systematically right facebook is doing this right so some of the things that we found is that systematically facebook was promoting political groups even in the run up to the presidential election and in the period after despite having promised congress repeatedly that they were not going to promote political groups because of the election season right we just published a story yesterday saying that um facebook in germany where we have set up another panel is um promoting the far right group Yeah. um in our panelist news feeds at three times as frequently as any other political group despite the fact that the far right group is actually a very small group and their supporters are a small portion of our panel and so this systematic approach allows us to move beyond the like suspicions and intuition that people have relied on and say you know factually we have an independent sample and it looks like you're doing x and then Facebook has to respond. Now Facebook generally responds like they did yesterday with our Germany reporting. Well, your sample is too small. Okay, my sample is very yeah, small. I saw that they responded a bit late though. But they did. They missed the deadline for responding and then they posted it on Twitter. But, you know, the fact is yes, our our panel is never going to be I mean, they have 2 billion, you know, users. <laughs> we we have a panel of about 1000 in the US and about 500 in Germany. We are definitely not right we're not trying to claim that we have the answer but what we are saying is we have the only independent view that you can get and the independent view shows something that is pretty different than what they're marketing 
Correct, correct. So I think it also uh, makes uh, leaves very little space for detractors. So uh, Julia, would you also extend this approach to say, you know, the kind of story Wall Street Journal did, like they accessed internal research documents at Facebook. So like yeah. if you were the editor and you had that story, would you like, would you say, and if it doesn't cause any harm to your source and if it's in public interest, would you release those documents? Because a lot of uh, criticism and the detractors to that report are saying that maybe Wall Street Journal should release all the documents that they have uh, in store with them. So like, how would you respond if you had that story? Yeah, well, first of all, I just want to say to anyone out there who's thinking of leaking us documents, please come visit us. We are always open for business. Um, yeah, I would have loved to get that uh, document trove that was leaked to the Wall Street Journal. I think it's very difficult to say whether we would have released them more or less than what they released. And I think the reason is source protection, right? You just can't tell um sometimes documents can't be released because they're too identifying to the source and so i don't want to second guess their decision there um i just i know that for us we would always push to release the most possible because i think that's the best service to the public but you definitely when somebody has risked their job and their life to provide you information you have to take steps to make sure that it's um safe they're safe and one thing that we do and i think is a best practice is often not to release the raw documents but to rebuild them so basically if somebody releases you a slide um you might there might be secret stuff in that that you can't tell from the eye but re reveals the um source this is what happened to reality winner who was this nsa leaker there were secret dots in the background of the slides that she gave to the intercept and it turns out the NSA was keeping track of each different um, little bit of dots. And so they could tell who the leaker was. So in general, in today's sophisticated tech world, you know, my feeling is best practice is to rebuild any sort of document that you get and place it. And so that it's a new clean um, representation of the information that said, that is stressful for the public who is seeking trust right the public prefers a raw document because they're like okay this is really real right so that's one reason to invest in building trust with your readers so that when you have that occasional exception where you have to show them an altered version you've built enough trust by releasing documents and data previously so that hopefully they trust you the few times that you do have to alter them Correct. Uh, now, again, one of the direct consequences of this consistent reporting on platform is that platforms will inherently become uh, a lot more secretive. Uh, so, in fact, I think it was it yesterday or today, like New York Times has done a uh, has done a piece on how what like what is Facebook sort of game plan going forward, and it has a lot to do with, of course, controlling the flow of information, but of also uh, uh, sort of closing any access to the data. So I earlier in the year, I think uh, they seized access to NYU's ad observatory also. I think uh, you also faced uh, similar issues uh, with the citizen browser. So as someone, you know, because uh, markups work and a lot of reporting on big tech is inherently dependent on using the data or access that these companies provide. So like how challenging do you think it will be if like, let's just say companies like Facebook, Google or any other platform companies just stop giving access to like researchers and think tanks. And do you think that we, we need to have like a policy frame, framework or something? Uh, because essentially this data is this data is being used in public interest. Do you think we need like a policy framework that mandates that companies cannot block access to that data, at least for journalists and researchers? Well, I think there's two kinds of data access, right? There's data that's already publicly available, and then there's data that's sort of, um, you know, provided to certain types of partners, right? So, for instance, the NYU um, researchers were cut off from Facebook's API, which is provided to partners who agree to certain terms. Um, you know, it was wrong, and they shouldn't have done it, but it also is their discretion to who they want to partner with what we do is we mostly collect data that's publicly available right so we scraped fifteen thousand search queries on google analyze them show that google puts its own products at the top of the page hogs the top of the page almost half of the top of the page for search results and 
um, that data is public, right? So, you know, but there's a battle, a legal battle about whether journalists can access publicly available data because many websites say in their terms of service, which no one has ever read, like don't scrape our page. And so yeah. the legal battle about that is playing out throughout the US. We have filed a brief at the Supreme Court um, arguing that publicly available data should be available to journalists, whether or not somebody writes a little thing in their terms of service saying you can't have it. It's kind of like if you put a billboard up on the highway, you can't say no one can take a picture of it, right? That, and that's essentially the argument that a lot of these tech companies are making. So I would say right now, the most defensible battle for journalists is just that we should be able to collect data that's already public, right? The idea of then asking companies to open a special door for us, I feel like is actually a secondary battle. And it's one that I'm not sure about because to be honest, like as a journalist, if a company came to me with a data set, like, like let's say I was a reporter covering oil and gas and Chevron gave me a data set and said like, this proves that like oil doesn't cause climate change. I mean, I would say, okay, I'll take a look at that data, but I'm gonna cross check it with a lot of other data. So the idea that journalists should really rely on these companies to give them vetted data, I think actually leads to actually more capture because they're not gonna provide data that doesn't make them look good. Correct. And I guess if they are providing data, they'll provide data that sort of suits them. Okay, yeah. so uh, 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 Zulia, let me zoom out a little bit and talk about, I want to talk about specifically for uh, online speech. Uh, if you see there is massive inequality, if you look at what platforms do to moderate speech, say in US, vis-a-vis -vis the kind of investment and what they do in markets like India, Brazil, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So clearly all their, whatever they are, anyway, there you can argue that uh, all these platforms are doing very little when it comes to uh, misinformation and online speech, but all of that work and investment and resource is focused on US. I, I think a big part of that uh, reason is the language because as you move out of US, you have multiple languages. But another big part is that because there is so much of scrutiny and accountability uh, within media, and of course, these are American companies uh, at the end of the day. But if you look at, uh, especially in countries like Brazil and India, like in, in India, what has happened is the kind of misinformation and online hate, it's now being used to mobilize voters. So it's gone to a level where it, I don't think we have like a similar thing, say in US or Europe, there is a lot of misinformation, but using that hate and misinformation to sort of uh, polarize people and effectively use it as a, as a tactic, like I was mentioning it to you, like we have, we have people in the government who have sort of argued that they have the agency to make anything go viral as long as it suits their uh, narrative. So uh, as, uh, as someone who follows big tech, A, how do you think uh, we can hold uh, American companies accountable to what they do outside in India? We know what happened in Myanmar and in countries like uh, Philippines and Brazil. And B, how important do you think for you know, organizations like yours and others who are uh, reporting on tech to also sort of look at data and look at issues outside US because that's the one that is not getting any media coverage uh, or attention at this point of time? Yeah, I mean, this is something I think about a lot because you know we're this small startup in New York, um, 30 people, 20 in the newsroom, and we write mostly about the US because, you know, that's where we are. <laughs> but, you know, the harms of these big tech platforms are probably greater outside the US. And so I've been trying to figure out ways to work more outside the US while still working within the constraints of being a tiny company. And so <laughs> that's sort of what we did with, an ex with our first ever international partnership with Germany which is the one I was just referring to where we were monitoring Facebook leading up to their elections, which are, I think, later this week. And so we're experimenting with ways that we could provide our tools to other newsrooms, because a lot of what our special sauce is, is our tools. And so if we can provide other newsrooms with the ability to use our tools, then maybe we can help um, promote this type of accountability work. That said, I would also say, though, there was plenty of great journalism about what was going on in Myanmar um, that wasn't based on tools, right? Literally just people reporting what they saw on Facebook. And 
Um, and that's still a very good route. And so I think there is a route for lots of journalists to hold these platforms accountable. And I think there is a lot of great journalism actually happening along those lines. I just would love to be able to supercharge them with some more automated tools if possible. Correct. But uh, within newsrooms, uh, like, like you said, but do you think that that's a, uh, that's a viewpoint that like other journalists and other editors also share that we, we effectively also have to start writing or start looking at issues and what the companies are doing outside US? Or do you think right now we aren't really there because there's so much happening within US that uh, first you would rather do a good job uh, as to what's happening in US and then move on? I mean, I think there is uh, definitely an interest in covering more outside the US. Definitely the big papers, the New York Times, Washington Post are devoting a lot more to it. There's a new startup called Rest of World um, that is actually entirely devoted to really covering tech in other countries. And so I think there is a growing understanding of it, but the media industry, as you may know, is kind of in a really bad space right now. Um, you know, the ad revenue has plummeted. A lot of um, news outlets are really struggling. Only a few national outlets are really doing well, and the rest of the industry is kind of collapsing. So it's just, um, uh, you know, we don't have a very viable business model for for journalism at all, right? And then when you add something like what I'm doing, which is like really expensive, as you said, programmers are expensive. The ones who come to work for me, they often take massive pay cuts and yet they're still the most expensive people in my newsroom, right? And so, um, so doing what I'm doing in particular is a particularly expensive kind of journalism that not a lot of places are willing to invest in when their business model is collapsing. And that's, I think, even more true around the world, right, where a lot of news outlets are struggling as well and not um, and the kind of thing that I'm doing is something that's just really hard to imagine investing in. Correct. Now, before I move on to the next question, if you're watching this and you have questions for uh, Julia, do go to www.themediarumble.com slash live. Uh, we'll be taking questions from there uh, in a few minutes. So if you have a question, do post that. Uh, but Julia, picking up on the revenue, you have a reader supported model like we do at News Laundry. And one of the fascin fascinating thing is that uh, you have a policy to not track uh, user data. So you don't use any third party trackers. Uh, you also try to store uh, as little data as possible. And I've seen yep. your surveys uh, and other practices uh, to do that. So, so that is very interesting because that's something that I directly work on. So now at News Laundry, we've been at free from day one. So that's, that's a core, U that's a core USP. And that's where our entire independent journalism is based on. Uh, but even then, like even someone like News Laundry, wherein we don't mind user data to sell it to say to sell it to advertisers or monetize it, we do end up using a third party tracker, say Google Analytics. And I think most newsrooms in the world will use Google Analytics, not because they would want to share data with Google, just because it's so accessible, easy to use it and, and get data from there. So, so first, how important is the decision for your journalism wherein you will not uh, attract user activity on your website? And secondly, how difficult does it make for you? Because if you are a reader supported model, you need to understand your audience and readers better. better. And the one way to do it is to collect some data around it. Uh, so yeah, so how difficult is it when you're not collecting uh, any data? And why is that decision so intrinsic to the kind of journalism you do at Markup? Well, I'll start with the question about why we do it, which is, you know, uh, for myself, I was a tech reporter for dozens of years, a long time. And all of, and for a long time, I've been covering privacy as one of the top issues. And all the, almost all of the time that I was writing about privacy at the Wall Street Journal and then at ProPublica, I would write a story, something like, oh, there's this new creepy thing that's happening on the internet. They're tracking you this way, that way, this way. And then I would have to put in parentheses and oh, by the way, the website you're reading this on is also doing that, right? Like, so my employer was often using some of these creepy techniques. And so it was just an awkward position to be in as a reporter, right? And um, I would have to get comment often from the Wall Street Journal, like I would call the business side and, and include their comment in my story about why are you doing this thing? 
And um, I felt like it also broke trust with readers because they were like, well, you're writing about this as if it's bad, but you're literally participating in it too. And so when I was founding the markup, I wanted to see if we could build something that was different that would also engender more trust with readers. And like you said, encourage them to donate, right? Because our model is all about donation. And so I thought, why do we need to track these people um, because it makes them feel terrible. And we we already know they care about tracking we cover. So they, we know yeah. that this is a group that's interested in this issue. And really, we don't need that information, right? We don't need, we're not selling ads. The reason you need to know all this stuff is actually oftentimes because you want to sell ads and the advertisers want to know, well, am I reaching men or women or what's the income, whatever. We're not selling ads, right? We're also, you know, not really going to change what we're writing about just because we found out that people who read us are higher income or lower income, right? So it's not going to change our fundamental business too much to know these details about people and it will really break the trust with them. And so it feels like um, it's a bet, but it's been working pretty well as a bet. And I will say that also we do get reader revenue, but most of our revenue is from really major donors, large donors, right? So who are foundations and private individuals. And so um, we're not entirely relying on small dollars. Um, and in that, in that world of small dollar donation, you probably would need, um, if you were going primarily that route, you probably would need a little bit more information to be able to more targeted in your messaging. And so, um, so it's an experiment. We'll see how well it works so far, fingers crossed, you know, it's been working okay. So I'm, you know, hoping we can keep doing it. Cause I think it really, it really does engender a lot of loyalty. The emails we get from people, they're so appreciative of, of this experience. And I also think it really is something important to model for the rest of the industry, which is that you don't need to do this, right? Like you don't need to make your readers feel totally exploited. Um, Sometimes you might, because selling advertising almost always just leads directly to that, but you don't always have to. Correct, correct. Uh, just a very interesting mention, uh, like that most of it is like bigger donors and you don't rely entirely on smaller donors. Uh, but do you think that is an hindrance? Do you think tech journalism is, it's, it's relatively difficult to raise money for like tech journalism, especially from regularly readers and small donors as compared to say political reporting or reporting otherwise, do you think that's an hindrance? And that's why you don't see a lot of uh, tech reporting in countries outside US? I don't know if it's, I actually don't think it's tech specific. I think it's investigative journalism. So investigative journalism is, um, I mean, we do it, that's our main thing, right? But it's kind of depressing to read, right? So, so you know, it's never gonna have, I think the loyal reader base maybe that like something with more fun <laughs> will have. And so I think actually the reason that it's difficult is that not everybody wants to come every day and read a same thing about how, you know, a company is doing a bad thing. <laughs> and so I think that that, Investigative newsrooms in general have largely been supported. I mean, ProPublica is the main model for this, and they're largely supported by major donors, big foundations, individuals who want that public impact. <clears throat> they still, and Texas Tribune is another one like this. And th these are our comparisons, and they basically have at most, you know, 10 to 20% reader um, yeah. support as part of their revenue. and. And then the rest of it is mostly major donors. Okay. So, uh, Julius, you, you've been investigative journal, journalist for long and you've been covering tech, tech for at least more than a decade. Mm -hmm. How do you think uh, the field has changed from where you started? I, I, I was uh, watching one of your interviews. I think uh, your, the first beat was uh, you were asked to cover the entirety of the internet. Yeah. So how has the space changed? Uh, has uh, is there more appetite uh, uh, for stories around tech? Like how has the space changed both for a reporter and for the reader? I mean, it's gotten much better. When I joined, when I became a tech reporter, um, you know, most tech coverage was really, I would say gadget focused, you know, what's the new gadget? And it was very much review focused, right? Like, is it good? Should I buy it? It was very consumer focused. Like, um, should I buy this thing? Should I not buy this thing? And there wasn't as much coverage about, well, what does it mean for the world, right? And I think of it a little bit like um, health coverage, right? So you can read, there's, there's 
personal health coverage, which is like, should I eat, you know, is yogurt good for me or bad for me, right? And I think tech was like that, but there wasn't a lot of the like public health coverage, which is like, um, you know, the way that hospitals are pricing their um, procedures is unfair and hurts society, which is also a well-developed area of coverage. And there's just basically health coverage has long, is a more mature field. And so there are people in both pieces of it. I think what's happening with tech is we're just starting to develop that public health aspect of our coverage. So we have in the past, I guess, five years, there's been a real push towards more understanding of like the broader issues and not just so much about like your choices, because it's not always about your personal choices. Like you don't have a personal choice in whether Facebook allows a certain thing or doesn't allow a certain thing, you know? Correct, correct. Uh, just I'll start taking questions. I think there's, I can see one question, but before that, I also wanted uh, to have you weigh on, on, this, on the kind of self-governance structures uh, platforms are making. So Facebook has the oversight board. Uh, I, I think they're also sort of toying with the idea of doing something very similar uh, for elections. So uh, how, where do you exactly see these self-governance structure? Do you think they, they, they play an important role? Are they effective? Or do you think it's, it's mostly like a PR exercise uh, to save face? Well, generally, um, companies start doing these time of self-regulatory regimes when they're trying to avoid actual regulation. <laughs> and certainly there are a lot of efforts around actually regulating these companies, right? For a long time, Washington was um, really standoffish about tech and because it was our biggest industry, right? It was print, they're printing money over there in Silicon Valley and um, nobody wanted to get in the way of it. But in the past couple of years, there's been a growing sentiment in Washington. There's been bills to break up the tech companies. There's been bills to regulate them. There's been antitrust lawsuits. And so I think you see the rise of self-regulation and the promotion of self-regulation as a way for the industry to try to argue, don't worry, we're taking care of it ourselves, right? And so I would say that that's generally where you see self-regulation. It's not as if companies come up with self-regulation just because they're good people, right? Like <laughs> they, they do it because of a business need, you know? Another thing is, uh... Like I said in the beginning also, I think for the longest time, the uh, big tech and platform enjoy like a lot of praise, so to say, right? I, like they were seen, and I think there's still a lot of innovation happening in these companies. Uh, but unlike now where there is a lot of scrutiny, media attention, I think let's just say five years back, there wasn't really, like everyone thought that like when like a platform said that we want to make this world a better place or like connect people in the community, people really bought into that. So, but you, like I said, you've been covering for long. So do you think when earlier, when you did stories on internet companies or platforms, did you face like resistance? Did it not get as much uh, uh, attention or feedback from readers or it's not really, that has not really changed in like say last five or six years. Has the reader's appetite or reader's feedback or attention to stories around platform and tech changed because readers are a lot more aware or that hasn't really changed uh, uh, for example, for how long has you been? Doing no, I think readers have become more aware. When I first started writing about these kinds of things, I would often get a lot of pushback from people saying, you know, why are you raining on this parade? Like, this is the greatest thing. And look, it is amazing. We carry a supercomputer around in our pocket, right? That's what a phone is. And like, I think there is a lot of great stuff about it, but I did used to get much more negative feedback about like, why are you such a downer? <laughs> you know, when I started this um, uh, series at the Wall Street Journal called What They Know About Privacy in 2010, um, there was a, there's a pundit online named Jeff Jarvis who said um, that I was creating a moral panic and that I was going to bring down the panic. internet. Yeah, and um, that I was I was I was going to destroy the internet, and I was like, well, that's I was actually really proud. I was like, I, if you think I personally can destroy the internet, like that's super cool. But um, but now you know Jeff in particular is like Mr. Critic, right? So people like him have come around because um, you know the conventional wisdom has come around, and people are more aware. And I think that honestly, the election of Trump. Well, and the Brexit vote were a real wake-up call for a lot of people about the fact that this wasn't just about creepy ads following you around. It was about 
the ability of political actors to use the micro targeting capacities to feed misinformation to the people who are most vulnerable to receive it. And I think realizing that I think was a wake up call for a lot of people. Okay. Uh, I can see one question. So I just ask uh, Tapsi Bhardwaj asks, please comment on media imperialism. Okay, I think that's the question. I'm not sure what <laughs> media uh, imperialism, but maybe a big corporate running the largest of the media networks. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, US media in particular has, and British media have um, a long history of acting very colonial in their coverage, right? Like there's, um, I remember that there was a period of time where um, every single article I read in the New York Times about India started with like a cow wandering the streets. They'd be like, I in India, in New Delhi, there's a cow wandering the streets and they're debating this very interesting thing here. You know, it is very, um, you know, just like, it had that feeling like I'm here with yeah. the natives, you know, <laughs> and more on the video also like a, a, any documentary or film on India will start in a crowded. Yes. With right. like cows around the corner. Cows and rickshaw drivers and like, yeah. you know, yeah. And, you know, my husband's Indian. I go to India every year and I, I know there's a lot more to the country than that stereotype. And what I think is really great is that I think that one of the great things about the internet is that it made that kind of reporting less palatable. The truth is that now, if you want to know what's happening in another country, when you Google around, you can just read the local press and or you can read a really informed um, person about it and you don't have to rely on that sort of, you know, anthropological view that is often presented by some of the more mainstream outlets. And I think that has forced actually the, the big papers and their foreign correspondents to, to be more sophisticated in their coverage, right? So I think you see a little bit less of that now, but it's still there, you know? So, and that's one reason I would say the markup is a little bit, I'm a little bit cautious about how we expand internationally. I don't wanna be what I call a parachute journalist where you just jump into a country, write a story, leave. I want to build tools and find ways to support local journalists to, to amplify and augment their reporting because they know more about what's going on on the ground than ever know. Okay. Uh, now, coming back to uh, platforms specifically about online speech, do you think our expectations from platforms, right? Like there should be no, there, there should be as less misinformation as possible. They should not have algorithms or systems that encourage uh, uh, online hate for that matter. Do you think our expectation is directly in odds with the kind of business model these companies have? So in fact, one of the stories that were there in the Wall Street Journal was how uh, one of the changes that Facebook pushed, which was advertised as uh, prioritizing uh, uh, friends and family content over political content, what it ended up doing was it made people more angry and then political parties sort of game their game according to that. So do you think yeah. that's basically what the core of the problem is that because of network effect, because these systems and products are designed for user engagement are designed for time spent or whatever, they're not designed for keeping safety uh, or privacy in mind. Do you think inherently there, there is a dichotomy and that's why like platforms get in trouble? I mean, I think there's a lot of reasons they get in trouble, but that focus okay. on engagement is definitely one of them, right? And, and that's driven by the advertising model, right? So the advertising model is you need to keep people's eyeballs um, focused on the content for as long as possible. And, you know, I, I, had, I took a class in business school um, about how you motivate people. And we read all this Shakespeare and stuff. It was very interesting. And at the end of the class, he was like, look, we could talk about all the things we learned or we could just say there's really only two ways to motivate people, fear or greed. And I think that like, honestly, like there is an element of truth to that, right? Like people, if you're scared, you you focus and you get angry and like those things get you engaged in a way. They um, And so there's an, when that Wall Street Journal came out, article came out showing the point system they had for how they optimized the algorithm, you know, it was clear that it was going to lead to more sort of outrage porn, you know, which is what 
um, ultimately these platforms have have ended up being. And so, um, so I think there's an element of their business model that is driven by advertising that like means there's always a tension between what they say they want to do and what they're actually doing. And it's worth remembering that the old days um, when there were few, were few media gatekeepers, right? So the editors of the Wall Street Journal and the editors at NBC who decided what was on the nightly news, they also made these calculations, right? And they were all white men and they would, but there was a sense of public interest. And so, you know, I went to the Wall Street Journal meetings where they would say like, what should we put on the front page? Obviously, if you just put puppies and anger, you know, outrage every day, it would be more interesting to readers, but there was a sense that you need to include the war in Syria because it's actually important for readers to know about that. Same thing with the nightly news. Like, of course, they would rather just cover like, you know, OJ Simpson driving down the highway, but they also felt a responsibility to cover the world. And that sense of public interest was driven by, you know, human motivations. And it was obviously flawed. There were all sorts of issues they didn't cover like racial and gender discrimination and they had an imperial model. That said, the algorithm doesn't have any of that in it, right? It doesn't have a public interest nozzle. And, you know, Facebook came out today again with yet another like, here's how we promote stuff. And, and they keep saying that they have some sort of public interest you know, threshold in their algorithm, but there's just no evidence to suggest that it's really working that well. Okay, and I'm also, of course, the, all, all the algorithms are opaque, so there is no way for us to- There's no way to know, exactly. Exactly, okay, so I think what, uh, uh, what has happened in India a couple of times that a couple of uh, outlets that have uh, reported very critically on the government, uh, their Facebook pages uh, have been banned or like for a couple of days, it didn't work. Now, there is no, uh, of course, there is no documentation or proof to say that because they reported critically on the government, it got like blocked or it wasn't available for a couple of days. But we've seen it happening. I think it happened with Mother Jones also in US. So at Markup, because uh, you report on all these platforms, is it also like a strategy to not have your distribution entirely based on all these platforms and look for other ways? Or you can't like as a media publisher, you can't really help it. Well, we're definitely on all the platforms because it's kind of like you have to be, but we are very concerned about that. And so we, you know, we have a strong newsletter subscriber base. We have, we do partnerships with a lot of like established media outlets. You know, we published our last investigation with the Associated Press. So it ran on the AP wire and was picked up by, you know, nearly 300 papers across the country. So we try to find other ways to distribute our work so that we're not entirely reliant, but we are on all, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, because you have to be. Like, it's just sort of the, yeah. the way you have to be in media. Correct. So I, I think there's one more question. I'll just quickly, before we wrap up, uh, this is from Rahul Vishnoi. Please comment on the overshadowing of media on the big tech over traditional newsroom based media. Okay, overshadowing of media on big tech over traditional newsrooms. Okay, I don't really understand. I'm not sure I understand that question either. <laughs> okay, maybe if Rahul can get back to us. <laughs> but uh, uh, thank you so much for your uh, time, uh, Julia. Really appreciate for you taking your time. Hopefully, you can do more stories uh, uh, that concerns uh, us and in India also, and maybe you can collaborate with some newsrooms. Uh, uh, in India. So yeah, I hope so. That. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you. you.